Well, welcome back to Tactics. By now, we've had three classes under our belts, and here's the fourth, and we have one more to go. And I want to review for you what we've learned prior to this session. In the first sessions, the first three especially, we learned our game plan. And in the game plan, we use the Colombo tactic. And the three steps to the Colombo tactic are the question, what do you mean by that? And I, I got to tell you, now that we're weeks into this and I'm recording and teaching, I'm using that question in lots of other settings and scenarios. It's really helpful. So um, gather information. What do you mean by that? And then number two, in the Colombo tactic, we reverse the burden of proof. What does that mean? We ask the question, how did you come to that conclusion or some form of that? How did you get there? Or what journey did you take? Or what happened that you ended up there? And what it does is it says, whoever makes the claim has the burden of proof. Can you see how that spares you some unnecessary stress? If someone makes the claim like God doesn't like America anymore, you don't have to get drawn into saying, yes, he does, and here's the reasons, which has you climbing the ropes into a boxing ring and fighting with someone. You don't have to do that. You can say, what do you mean by God? And, well, how'd you get to that conclusion? You're engaging in a gentle, respectful conversation. And then third, we use questions to make a point, to lead somewhere. We have a target in view. And as Christians, our target is we want to bring somebody who isn't a believer to the place where they can maybe have a rock in their shoe and think different regarding Jesus and Christianity. So that's our target. So our questions are like arrows shooting towards the target. And we use the questions to help the other person provide the pieces of the argument that we want to use to make our particular point. Why do we do that? Well, the pieces of the argument that they make that are put on the table are very difficult for them to take back off the table. And then we use those pieces to make our point. Those are Colombo tactics. We also learned how to improve our Colombo skill. How do we improve this skill? And we do that, number one, we anticipate. And that means maybe just I anticipate I'm going to have opportunities today. Or it may mean, you know, I'm going into a situation today, family, work, somewhere. And I think there's going to be opportunities. So we anticipate it. And we sort of treat it as though it's going to happen. And then we reflect, right? Reflect, meaning go back, take a look at what you've learned. Review it. That, that increases the chances that you'll take it in. All right? So anticipate, reflect, and then practice. Practice makes perfect. Like I said, I think I said before, but you know, if someone made you practice the tube every day, three hours a day, <laughs> In 60 days or 66 days for sure, you'd be pretty good at the tube, and no matter how you felt about being forced to do it, why? Because our brain absorbs things through practice. And then we learned how to defend ourselves using a technique called innocent as doves. When do we use innocent as doves? Well, we use it when Columbo's used against you. In other words, they're using Columbo tactic number three trying to lead us to their destination. By using the innocent as doves technique or tactic, we get back in the driver's seat of the conversation. So that's a review. Now let's dig into some new material for today's teaching. In this session, we're going to learn how to exploit a flaw or a weakness in the other person's argument using the Colombo tactic. And there are different tactics to help us do that. Number one, this is a powerful tactic that will help you identify a common mistake. It's called the suicide tactic. And what it means is it's a tactic used to expose self-refuting claims, ideas, or arguments. They refute themselves once you examine and bring it into the light. And we're going to learn about points of view that actually commit suicide. The points of view just sort of kill themselves off. 
We're going to look at examples of how we can use questions to make the point that another person's view self-refutes. And you know what? When we do this, as we learn it, we don't have to do a lot of work. It's really about paying attention. I'm listening carefully, watching, and being totally engaged with the other person to what? To observe and kind of notice the self-canceling properties. You see, in self-refuting claims or phrases, the seeds of its own destruction are already built into the statements. We just have to see it. Here's an example. If someone says, you know, I, I can't speak a word of English. That's a silly example, but stop for a moment. They just used English to say they can't speak a word of English. It cancels itself. The cancellation is contained in the sentence. A comical way of looking at it, something Kokel uses in his teaching, is uh, Charlie Brown and Lucy. Charlie Brown's in a room and Lucy comes in and says, I've just decided no is my answer to everything. Everything in life. No. He goes, so, so no is going to be your answer. She goes, yes. Oh, darn it. Okay, that's not going to work. She just canceled her own point of view. So... Here's another one. If someone says, you know, you can't know anything for sure. You can't know anything for sure. I've heard that. Ask them this question. Are you sure about that? <laughs> the view instantly falls apart. And why does it work? Why does the suicide tactic work? Because views like this that are expressed are statements about themselves. And here's the principle. When a view fails to satisfy its own criteria for validity, it is self-refuting. What it means is the moment this type of view is uttered, it's false. That sentence is false the moment it comes out. Here's an example. Let me give you an example. And this is a common statement I've heard many times. You, you shouldn't push your morality on me. But what might you say when they're done? Well, when you say that, it seems to me that you're pushing your view on me. They're doing exactly what they just said you're doing and accused you of, and it kills their point. You see how this example, this example, transfers to so many other similar statements. So how do you identify these statements? Follow these steps. You have to carefully listen to identify the basic claim. And you ask yourself this, does that claim apply to itself? For example, in the phrase I just used, or the sentence, or the claim, you shouldn't make moral judgments. The word should or shouldn't is itself a moral judgment. It makes its own moral judgment. So yeah, I've, I've identified the basic claim. And, or this statement, there is no truth. If we ask, well, is that statement true? Then it exposes it and cancels it. How about another one like this? Someone says to you, you know, it's wrong to judge. It's just wrong to judge. Stop for a moment. Think about that. That statement, it's wrong to judge, is a, judge, a judgmental statement that judges me. Because they're saying it to me about my view, right? Right? We're talking, they say, it's wrong to judge. Well, that's a judgmental statement that was just made to me about me. Here's another one. You know, it's, this is very common. It's wrong to try and change other people's viewpoints, especially religious viewpoints. It's wrong. Well, that's a statement in a conversation designed to address my viewpoint, my viewpoint, isn't it? It's designed to address my viewpoint. But see, here's what's happening. That person, by staying that, is trying to change my viewpoint. Now they're stuck. They just said you shouldn't try to change another person's religious viewpoint. And yet, they're trying to change mine. Here's one. This is common. This may be even growing in some sort of cultural popularity. All religions are equally true and valid. Isn't that a peaceful, soft and fuzzy statement? That way you can just open your arms and embrace all people in all ways. 
It's all the same thing. It's all spiritual. All religions are equally true and valid. That is called pluralism. Plural for many, pluralism. Here's the problem. If that statement were true, it would mean that my Christian faith is considered equally valid. That would mean Christianity is true, right? That would mean the claim of Jesus, his claim from his mouth, to be the savior of the world is true and valid. And if he's my savior, it's only because he first is the world's savior, right? So if others don't need Jesus to save them, they don't, then I don't either, right? You can't be apart from that. So in that case, following Christianity, I'd just be wasting my time. And if it's true that only Jesus saves, and Christianity teaches that, that statement in itself makes the other religion's claims invalid, doesn't it? Now, I'm not trying to be unkind or demeaning in any way, but just think about the facts of it, the evidence of it, and the logic in the statement. It would make other claims false if Christianity is true and if all religions are equally valid and true. Automatically, the other ones fall away. So the statement commits suicide. And here's something we know. Either Christianity is true and all other religions are false, or the opposite. It's not true, and the other religions are equally true and valid, despite the fact that the other religions do not accept other religions as equally true and valid. You understand that, right? That statement itself is a massive, godlike statement, presuming that someone has knowledge greater than the great scholars of all the world religions. That's just crazy. So all the religions can be false. They can all be false in, in just logical reasoning. But they cannot all be true. So when someone says, here's my truth, when it comes to spiritual issues, be on alert. Be watchful for a way to, in to ask a question. Because if someone says, well, my spirituality is my truth, as though they're claiming equal ground, with you saying Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life? Well, what they really are saying is that's their belief. Because everything can't be true. It violates the meaning of the word truth. If everything was true, it means they have beliefs. All right? So they can all be false, but they can't all be true. And here's another reality within this pluralism. Religions have contradictory and conflicting truth claims. They're contradictory and conflicting truth claims. If they're all equally true and valid, how can Christianity be completely true, meaning Jesus paid the price for our sin, willingly went to the cross, was tortured, died, was placed in the tomb, the tomb was sealed, and the rock rolled away, and he rose again as predicted, as prophesied, how can that be true, but Islam is equally true, which says he never died, and he's not the Messiah? How can both be true? The answer is they can't. Only one can be. So let's look at some other statements that people make. Only science can give us reliable truth. Only science does that. Science gives us reliable truth. Well, when you say that, what they're saying is you can only know what has been proven by science. So isn't this statement about knowledge? Science gives us knowledge, and from knowledge we can decide what's reliably true. But the statement is a claim itself that purports to be true. And the person using it is claiming that they can know, but that puts them in a bind. Because the only way they can make the claim is if there is scientific evidence that that statement is true. And guess what? There's no scientific evidence that that statement is true. It's self-refuting. Here's another one for people that just want to be spiritually free-floating and neutral about everyone and just love everyone with, with, with no real rock to ground themselves. 
the statement, God doesn't take sides. God doesn't take sides. Now, I'm talking about football. I would agree. He probably doesn't take sides in football, I think. But God doesn't take sides. So what this person is saying is that God doesn't take sides, which presumes that God agrees with them on that question, doesn't it? So ask the person, if that's said to you, ask them, is that your view, that God doesn't take sides? Get them to answer, they made the claim, and put their piece on the table. Just ask them, is that your view? They're probably going to say, yeah. Good, they just put it on the table. That's their view. It's important because that's a question about God's nature. The next question is, say, do you think that's God's view? Yeah. So you're saying if it's your view and God's view, you're saying God is on your side of this issue. You see? It's another example of a self-refuting statement when you think about it, isn't it? Now, here's another tactic we have to think about. Sibling rivalry. You know, siblings, brother, sister, brother, brother, sister, sister, you know, siblings. S sibling rivalry. And this happens when objections come in pairs, in a sentence, or a claim statement, a truth claim. Here's an example. If your God exists, why is there so much evil in the world? This comes up a lot. So this complaint, in order to be legitimate, must acknowledge that there actually is evil in the world, right? They're saying evil exists. I know it. It does. And they could probably tell you what they believe evil is. But to say there's evil in the world requires an objective morality, doesn't it? Because if there's no objective morality creating laws over everybody, then there can't be any breaking of laws. So if there's not an objective standard about the speed limit on the freeway, I say, you know what? I'll go whatever speed I want. Someone else can say, that's not a good speed. I think the speed you go at is wrong. You're legitimately able to say, I think yours is wrong and I think mine's better. Why? There's no objective moral standard. There's nothing to consult. So nobody's being bad on the freeway, are they? Nobody's breaking any laws. There are none. So if you're in that camp, you're what we would call a moral relativist. And if you're a moral relativist, meaning morals are relative, they're kind of what I feel they are and what I think they are, then there can't be a problem of evil. There just can't be. If there's a problem of evil, and I know there is, then moral relativism is false. You see, we can't have them both. It simply doesn't work. So this statement that if your God exists, why is there so much evil in the world, commits sibling rivalry suicide. And if moral relativism is true, and it's just the free thing of free people not bound by any religious dogma or any standards, then what's to stop me from saying, you know, I believe I have a right. Because remember, rights are given by some source. Otherwise, we just make up rights for ourselves. I think it's a right. This is a right. That's a right. I could say to my neighbor at the end of the street, you know, I, I noticed you leave in the day and I just... I believe I have a right to try all the doors in your house, and if one's open, to take stuff I want. They say, you don't have a right to do that. I'd say, well, I think I do. If they were moral relativists, all they could say is, we don't think you have that right. And I'd say, well, based on what? There's no objective standard. You see the problem we have with moral relativism. So here's what we learned in this section. We're going to review it briefly before we go into the next section. We learn what a self-refuting claim is. It refutes itself. We simply observe and point it out. And we learned how to recognize when someone's view self-destructs. And what we're thinking, we ask, is does this claim apply to itself? 
Like, you shouldn't push your morality on someone else. Should being a moral word. Oh, this statement doesn't even work in itself. It commits, and then sibling rivalry, suicide. If God exists, why is there so much evil? Two ideas in one sentence, and they both commit suicide because they don't work. Now we're going to move to the next tactic called taking the roof off. Remember early on, we gave an example of a roof with no walls. And a roof with no walls is just a claim somebody makes that you realize quickly after a few questions isn't really an argument or a case they can build. They're just saying it because they're saying it because they think it. So that's a roof, but there's no walls to support it, right? In this example, we're looking at taking the roof off. This is a tactic developed and used to great effect by Francis Schaeffer. Uh, in growing up, once I became a believer, I heard of Francis Schaeffer. I read some of his work, and many, many uh, pastors and church leaders and theologians and theology students in seminaries would study the works of Dr. Francis Schaeffer. In fact, at one point, he had a sort of a, a training center in Labrie, Switzerland, that people could apply to and go and live there for a time. My friend Mike took his wife and kids there and spent three months there, just working through developing and strengthening their theology at the mentoring of Francis Schaeffer. He died in 1982. He was a Presbyterian pastor, a theologian, and a philosopher, still studied extensively and always will be, I would think. And this tactic, taking the roof off, was the very first tactic Greg Kokel ever learned. And he got it from reading the work of Francis Schaeffer. So it's kind of like the idea contained in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, and I'll just paraphrase it. Jesus is doing powerful work, and the Jewish leaders say, he, he must be doing this work. He cast a demon out by Satan's hand. You know, Satan's the one motivating him. And Jesus says, well, let's take a look at that statement. How in the world could, would, why in the world would Satan give me the power to throw him out? Doesn't make any sense, does it? He exposes, Jesus does, the absurdity of the Jewish leader's argument. What it means is Jesus was taking the roof off. So here's roof removal. Roof removal. Step one, when a claim is cloudy and hard to grasp, you're not sure exactly what the other person is saying. You use your Columbo questions to figure it out and just nail it down. Exactly what are they claiming? What is the truth claim here? Number two, once you've figured out what it is, you give it a test drive. Like you get it in, in the car with it. And it means you're going to accept, if you accept their view, like the, this claim they're, sta they're, they're making, you say, all right, let's say I accept what you're saying. Let's take it on a test drive. That means I'm taking their claim seriously. And we drive it for a while, but it drives right off a cliff. That's because the absurdity becomes clear in it just like the situation in Matthew 12 with Jesus. He says, so you're saying, hmm, that because I was able to cast demons out, you're saying the prince of demons gave me the power to cast him and his demons out. Now, that's a test drive. And he drove it right to the point where it goes over the cliff. It doesn't make any sense at all. And if it goes over the cliff, it points out the problem with their statement, doesn't it? So Schaefer coined a term for it. He called it reductio ad absurdum. Reductio ad absurdum, or reductio for short. It means you're taking a point of view to its absurd consequence. And I do it in little ways now when I'm counseling with folks. I may have someone that I've come to know and have a relationship with in counseling. And they might say, I, you know, I lost my job. I've tried for three other, three other jobs. I'll never get a job again. 
Well, I know they're saying that statement from a painful place, but I also know it's a false claim. It's an error in, in their, their thinking. But if they keep saying it, I say, all right, so let, let's think about that. Let's drive that. You're saying no matter what you try to do, you're only 32 for the years ahead. If you live to be a ripe old age, you will never have a job again. You know what? When I test drive it, they'll say, well, that's not, I'm sure I'll get a job at some point. Aha. We expose the absurdity of the statement. So why is this tactic so powerful? Schaefer invented it, and there's certain parts to this tactic we need to understand. Here's the way it works. Since Christianity is true, I know it's true. You're watching this. I certainly hope you're convinced it's true. If it's true, then it's also true that every human being ever made is made in the image of God, right? In the Latin, imago Dei, image of God. So every human being is created by God in the image of God, and every human being now lives in the world that God created. God created the world. We know that first part of 1 Corinthians. We know it in Genesis. God created the world. So if a person denies God or anything about God's world that he or she has to live in, I live in it, you live in it, then they're actually, here it is, they're denying reality. They're denying reality because Christianity is true. It's not an idea. It's not a helpful spiritual you know, track to be on. It's not a helpful practice to feel better. It's true. We're Imago Dei. We live in the world God created. So if we deny anything about this world, we're actually denying reality. And here's what we know. I've learned this the hard way. We all know that if we don't take the world seriously, the one we live in, it's going to get our attention, maybe in a painful way. I used to backpack with my family up in the Sierras, up in the Dardanelles, up to the lakes up there, Sword Lake, Lost Lake. And we got to these cliffs 30, 40 feet up, and we'd say, you know, let's jump off them, and we did. Then we saw these higher ones. And we thought, why don't we just do that? We didn't do it. Part of us understood there's a reality here, and if we pretend that reality doesn't exist, we could be injured. We have to respect it, right? So if there's a denial, if you, so here, here's the way it works. If we're denying or anybody's denying some fact of the Christian world reality, then that belief that denies Christianity is contrary to the Christian worldview, right? And it's a denial of reality itself. And there's going to be a collision between the false worldview and the way the world actually is. See, isn't that beautiful? It's not just, I know Jesus is my Savior. Everything I see and touch and feel and experience is also God's. All of it. It's real. It has rules and physics and principles. It follows all of that. If I deny... Any part of that, from Jesus all the way to the reality, I could be in a real bad place. So there's, there's that tension between these two views. If you deny it, you're outside of reality, and there's a collision. Schaefer calls that the point of tension. So how, do we, how does this come together? It means that we take the roof off by making the person face the consequences of their own View. Remember, our questions follows a statement to its absurd, you know, going off the cliff, its absurd end. And we then take the roof off what they're saying, and they have to look at the consequences of their own view. So how do you take the roof off of someone who says, here's one, there is no objective morality? Well, what you demonstrate and it's not hard to do, is that person doesn't even really believe what they're saying to you. They don't even really believe what they're saying they believe. They talk about it, but it falls apart in their own responses to questions. You see, because the way they live, and just watch them. I have members of my family like that. No, we're free of any influence or taint of any religion. 
We just create our own way. Well, then how do you know what's good and bad, right or wrong? We just know. And they follow objective morality. They don't break into other people's houses. They don't go up and sock somebody because they don't like the way they look. They don't walk out of Safeway without paying. They follow an objective morality. And that objective morality issues laws and rights that they're actually holding while denying objective morality. So what do we do? We create a situation that forces them to take the roof off of their own view and we get them there and make them face the facts. So let's look at one example here. A couple of examples. How about naturalistic Darwinian evolution? And in that principle, Darwinism, boil it all down, there's one primary rule that defines it. The only rule that matters is that the strong rule the weak. That's the core principle of Darwinism. It's not that the strong should care for the weak, honor the weak, lift up the weak, or anything. Those would be moral principles. Darwinism says there's no moral objective principles in evolution. Like if this group of animals, you know, living in this part of the forest happens to be stronger than the other group, they just go over there and take their turf. That's what they, that's what they do. So it's not real, even in their own life, but they're claiming that it is. So we can ask the Colombo question. Here's an important one. You can fill in the blanks with anything you want that feels like a better topical uh, point. But Coco uses this one, and I found it fascinating. He says, all right, well, if there's no objective moral principles or standards, can you tell me your principled objection to genocide? Genocide is wiping out an entire group of people. Like in Rwanda, decades ago, where one tribe worked hard to wipe out the other tribe and they killed over 800,000 people. That's genocide. So tell me your principal objection, objection to genocide. Before they answer, think of this. Joseph Stalin, Russia, Mao Zedong, China, Pol Pot, Cambodia, many others who followed Darwinism and were atheists. It was strong rule the weak. They followed that principle. They made themselves stronger and ruled the weak. And what happened? Hundreds of millions of people died. Some folks say, you know, Christianity has just killed so many people. You know what? If you looked at the chart of uh, religious views or atheism, which one's responsible for more deaths? It's atheism. By far. Far and away. Not even close. So that falls apart. So what's happening when you point all this out is you're taking the roof off. All right? You're taking the roof off. Here's another example. There's a guy named Sam Harris. He's one of the three or four most well-known atheists. They're highly educated. They're prolific authors. They debate anybody everywhere. And well-educated uh, well Christian apologists debate them all the time. Sam Harris is one, and he believes in determinism. What does that mean? Everything that we do or say is predetermined by things that happen before us in our own life. So we don't even have free choice. We just don't. We don't have free will. We just don't have it. He, he promotes that. He believes it. He defends it. The problem is with determinism, if you have that view, is you can't have any morality. Where would morality come from? You can't have people praised for good things. You can't have them blamed or punished for bad things. Why is that? Well, they didn't do good because they chose it. They did good because it was all predetermined that they would do good. They're robots. And these bad people, you can't punish them and put them in prison unless you think they're still dangerous. Lock them away. But even that would be a moral principle, wouldn't it be? You see? You can't blame anybody or praise anybody. There's no choice there with determinism. And the irony is Harris can't even argue for atheism. He can't. Because he would have to be free to assess the argument and then choose a conclusion based on the evidence. And even then, we could say, well, you only believe, according to your paradigm, Sam, you only believe in atheism because you were determined to believe that. Therefore, your view is invalid. So we take the roof off and we point out that the person's worldview 
can only give these few world goods, but the rest doesn't work. Bummer for them. If that person you're talking to wants morality, rationality, free will, he will only get it from our world, the real world, the Christian world. Remember, Imago Dei, creation, that is reality. It can't be partial, it can't be occasional, and it can't be a feeling. It's a fact. If Jesus is who he says he is, and I know that he is, then all the rest is true. So what we taught in this session, briefly we'll recap taking the roof off, letting someone's uh, comments go to a point where it's exposed for their thinking, and reductio ad absurdum in that same process where the absurdity shows up and they see it and have to look at it, and the point of tension in between the reality of the Christian view and people who don't believe and don't ascribe to the Christian view and that tension in between the two. So I look forward to our small group online session. There'll be questions for you. Hopefully you've already got them uh, ready to go on your screen or printed out. And my wife, Heather, and I will join you on Wednesday night. Until then, God bless. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. To join, please visit our Wednesday night at Shoreline online page on our website and click Join Discussion for the Tactics class. We will dig deeper into the truths we just heard and spend some time in fellowship and prayer. We'll see you there.